Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm, I'm excited to share uh, something I've been thinking about recently. Um, it looks like the, the group is not huge, so please uh, ask questions if you have any along the way. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about something called local quantum error correcting codes. And so the main goal of the talk is to explain what that is. <laughs> and then the second goal of the talk is to explain why uh, it's very useful to um, think about this geometrically. And I'll try to present the result that kind of combines error correcting codes and geometry. Um, okay, so uh, to motivate uh, this, this quantum stuff, we're going to start with just like a, a problem from classical error correction. Um, so why do we need error correcting codes? So <clears throat> suppose we'd like to send a message of several zero one one bits through a noisy channel. So like n bits, zero and one. And as the bits move through the channel, some of them get flipped because of some noise or other in, um, influence. And so the received message at the other end is different from the original. And we need a way to recover the original. Okay. So one solution is we sit a, fix a set of allowable code words ahead of time. So that's a set of messages that there's, uh, the receiver and the sender both know. And we hope that the closest um, um, code word to the received message is the original message, which we know how to be a code word. Okay. Um, so here is a um, here's the mathematical setup for for that. Um, so a classical code um, uh, curly C is a two term chain complex of F two vector spaces uh, with a distinguished set of basis representatives. So we have C one, which is a F two vector space, and then we have some matrix H one. Um, that sends C1 to C0, it's another vector space. And every, all the coefficients are in F2, okay? Um, so a bit of information is going to be a basis vector in C1. So here you're thinking of linear codes. Yeah, linear codes. Um, and the message is gonna be some vector W in C1. So like the i coordinate of, uh, of the vector w is going to be correspond to some basis vector in c1 um, and so that's what we call a bit um, and the allowable code words are going to be all the vectors uh, in the subspace kernel of h1 okay um, so the important quantity of a classical code is its distance and so the distance is the minimum Hamming weight of a vector in the kernel of H1, the minimum um, weight uh, of a non-zero vector in the, in the allowable code words. This should be W not equal to zero. Um, and the idea is that if um, less than distance over two, oops, um, if less than distance over two flips or errors occur to the message we send, then there's going to be a unique uh, code word, a vector in the kernel of H1, which is closest to the received message. That's just the triangle inequality. Great. Okay. Uh, so there is a quantum analog to the situation. Um, and here in the quantum analog, there's two different errors that can occur. I won't go into that. That's like a whole other uh, lecture in um, quantum computing. Um, but what that corresponds to on the math side is that now instead of a two-term chain complex, we have a three-term chain complex of, vector, of F2 vector spaces um, with a distinguished set of basis representatives. So now we have this extra C2 and this H2 transpose. And we have some conditions on H1 and H2. So H1 composed with H2 transpose is zero. So it's just a chain complex. Okay, and now instead of bits, we have qubits, which roughly correspond to uh, the basis vectors of C1. And just like we had code words before, we have something called logical qubits, which are the, uh, the actual information that we work with or that we care about. And these are the basis vectors in the kernel of H1 
mod the image of H2 transpose. So kind of representatives of the homology, the first homology group of this chain complex. Okay. Uh, so the intuition is that if we want to make uh, some kind of quantum computer, we need a lot of qubits and we want to protect uh, the information inside a logical qubit using those, using these large amounts of qubits. Um, so that's the rough intuition and we're going to mostly be focused on the mathematics of these chain complexes. Okay, and so there's, there's an analogous notion of distance. So that's the minimum Hamming weight of a vector W, W is non-zero again, uh, which is either, W is either in the kernel of H1 mod the image of H2 transpose, or it's inside the kernel of H2 mod the image of H1 transpose. So again, there's these two subspaces we need to be concerned with roughly because there's two types of errors that occur in the quantum world. Um, and the larger the distance, the more we can protect the information from errors analogously to the classical case. So saying if you have a vector in C1 and, and you want to flip its value, so the logical value, you need to change a lot of bits. That's right. So, so let, let's suppose you have like a vector in here. So this could be represented by a vector in C1. And if the distance is very large, then a lot of the qubits need to be flipped in order for you to get far away from this logical qubit. So like analogously, it's a lot of errors need to occur um, to move you far away from uh, a code word so that you don't know where, which code word was you were closest to originally. Is the dimension of the homology would be one or something? Uh, the dimension of the homology is whatever the dimension of this vector space is. But if it's like, if you're calling it a bit, it doesn't have to be like two values or? Um, yeah, so it's, that becomes tricky to explain. It's not two values. Strictly speaking, a qubit is actually an element in the like unit unit vectors in C2. But this is a very simplified model. Uh, it's actually, so this model comes from these people um, called their Bank Stein. So they invented a way to kind of nicely package a lot of complicated like quantum physics into this model. Can you give some indication of why the second term in the distance, the kernel of H2 by image of H1 transpose? Um, it would be like reversing the arrows. Right, right. But, uh, why is it that you? So this is so this is uh, cohomology. Right, sure, I understand. But uh, why? What's the intuition of why this has anything to do with errors in the quantum world? Just an intuition, even if it's vague. Do you, do you have anything? Mm. Or you just import it as a black box and this is what physicists tell you that it could be. <laughs> I think that's a good way to think about it. Um, yeah, so I mean, the, roughly the idea is that there's the errors are kind of operators that act on these qubits that are in C2, complex mm -hmm. space squared. And there's two kinds of operators, like X and Z. Okay. So whatever that means. And then, so... Um, you need to be in kind of two spaces. You need to do two kinds of operations. So there's like secretly two code spaces. One is this one. And this code space makes, makes, is very good at protecting against like the X operator errors. And like being in here, codes and code words in here are very good at protecting against the uh, errors, something like that. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a little, it gets a little hard to explain more. <laughs> And perhaps uh, maybe another vague question: Why is it that homology is the correct thing to look at? I mean, even if you ignore the second term, why should we look at kernel by image instead of just as we were looking before in the classical case? Um, I think that's also going to require delving into like okay. these operators. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Then just carry. On. Oh. Uh, Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's fine. Just give it a second. No, come out. <laughs> 
Okay, so uh, I'm going to give kind of a, a classical example of a quantum called a code that's called a toric code. And we'll see already kind of geometry enters into the picture here. So we let M be a, a triangulation of a standard two torus with V triangles. Okay, so it's kind of looks like this. So a torus is uh, a square with opposite sides identified. And we're going to uh, triangulate it in kind of some pretty standard way like this. And there's going to be V triangles. So this side is roughly length square root of V. Cool. And CI is going to be the vector space spanned by the I simplices of M. And because there's a triangulation, there is a natural boundary map that sends CI to CI minus one. So what that means is that if you have a basis vector, which is like in C2, which is this triangle, the boundary map sends it to these three edges, which is a vector in C1. So the three edges are going to be three basis vectors in C1. And uh, there's a natural chain complex associated to a triangulation. And so that gives us a quantum code for free, kind of. Um, so the qubits here, which are going to be the basis vectors in C1, are like the edges in the triangulation. And this story code, it has v, roughly v qubits, two logical qubits. The reason that there's two is because the homology of the torus has dimension two. And it has distance roughly uh, v to the one half. Um, and we can get into that uh, a little bit later, but the rough reason is that it takes square root of the edges to represent any homology, non-trivial homology class. So if we go back, this is kind of the, these are kind of elements in a homology class, and this is kind of the number, um, the size of them, the number of uh, like simplices you need to represent it. Is this what you call systems or? Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll come to this after. Okay. Um, so I'm going to do a big jump from the Tor code to a result that happened last year. It's by Pantelev Kalachev and Leverie Zimor. And the result is that uh, there's some universal constant epsilon and, and, arbit for, for, so, and arbitrarily large V, uh, so that there is a, a code C with V qubits, epsilon V logical qubits, and distance also at least epsilon V. Um, so the number of logical qubits and the distance is linear in the number of qubits. So that's very surprising. It was for the quantum world. And it's, uh, there's some very difficult and pretty mathematics that goes into it. And it combines uh, expanders with symmetries. So like things coming from Cayley graphs and some additional expander properties coming from randomness. So I'm not gonna talk about this result anymore, but, but I'm going to use it later. Um, and I wanted to advertise it uh, for anybody who is interested in expanders. It's an explicit construction. Uh, well, so there's some randomness involved, at least in the construction I know. Um, but otherwise, yeah, they... they the constant size B is right there. For computer scientists, we can brute force it. Sometimes they're like construction, they're really cool. But it's a constant size on the code. Does it come from like triangle complex or? No, no, no. it's uh, it's algebraic. Uh, okay. So there's, there's some big geometric intuitions, but uh, they don't actually draw any pictures really, so. Okay. Uh, so I want to introduce some more physical restrictions that are going to be relevant to us. So here's our code up there. It's just this chain complex with three vector spaces. And again, the setup is that the qubits are in some state, uh, W, which is a vector in C1. And over time, errors occur from noise change. Uh, errors from noise change this state to another state, W prime, just another vector. 
Um, and in order to recover the original W, we need to perform operations, like actual some computing operations uh, that involve evaluating uh, H1 of W prime and H2 of W prime. Um, so we now kind of care about um, what these operations look like because we need to realize them uh, in some physical architecture. Um, and so a basic uh, part of these operations is something called a check. And a check is the set of basis vectors of C1, which correspond to the non-zero entries of a single row H1 or uh, H2. So if you have like H1 here, and let's say it has two non-zero entries in this row, then um, let's say columns are two non-zero columns in this row, I and J, then I and J qubits are going to be part of the same check. So it's like, so it's like to do this uh, matrix multiplication, you need to do this row times this column. And it's whatever entries you need to be aware of in this row. Okay. So for each row of H1 and H2, there's a check. Um, um, and so for uh, kind of intuitive computational reasons, we only want to consider sparse H1 and H2, i.e. there is a constant number of non-zero entries in each row and column. So that's supposed to make the computational doable. And then one additional restraint comes from how the qubits are placed in physical space. So each qubit is represented by some physical object, maybe like a spin of an electron. And um, they're roughly positioned on, a, on, a, on lattice points of a three-dimensional lattice. So that means there's an injective map from the qubits to C cubed. Um, and <clears throat> once we position these qubits, we have to make some connections between them that correspond to the checks to kind of realize that check physically. So the next definition is supposed to place some restrictions on these connections. <clears throat> so uh, a CSS code with V qubits is called local. If there is this injective map from the qubits to Z cubed intersected the ball of radius roughly V to the one third, and the image of the qubits in any check lie in a, a ball of constant radius. So that says to like implement the quantum these qubits into some computer, you only need to make connections that are not too far apart in space. So if you have some cube of qubits, you only need to make connections within some small ball for many balls. That's, so that's the rough intuition. You're just trying to detect the error, or you're also trying to connect to correct it. We're trying to correct it, and so in order to correct it, we need to do these check operations. In order to the check operations, we need to make these connections, and I'm trying to describe mathematically what it, like what the physical limitations are, making these connections. So that's that's what we call a local code. Okay, um, so let's go back to our example of a toric code. Um, so a toric code is local. Um, well, <clears throat> well it's some, uh, being local is a condition on some checks and the checks turn out to be all the simplices that are in the boundary of a triangle or all the edges that are, in, that are connected to some vertex. You can check that by just looking at what the boundary and co-boundary matrices are. So all we need to do is find kind of a map from this torus to R3 that kind of keeps these, keeps edges that are boundaries of triangles or edges that are next to a vertex close together. And the, the rough intuition is that we can just project it to R2. And if this, if this triangulation is standard, that property is satisfied, right? 
So this is even better than local because we're actually placing the qubits in R2 instead of R3. And edges that are, so edges are the qubits and edges that are part of the check, they stay close together in the image. Jack, think you are too going to get a problem with the first requirement of locality that uh, it needs to be an above radius B to the one third. Um, Somehow it looks like this first constraint right. says projecting to a plane is a bad idea. Uh, so Which if, I don't understand why you have that constraint there, but if you can represent it in the plane, is it better? Huh? Yeah. So it it turns out that for you can't. You can't do something much more interesting than a tor code in a plane, right. but you can do something much more interesting in three dimensions. Right, sure, sure, but I don't understand why it's the constraint. Um, it, yeah, it's not. It's, this constraint is not so important. Okay. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's that's what I was imagining because like, this is just saying you have to use the third dimension. You can't project it to two dimensions. That's the constraint. Uh, but on the other hand, it's like, okay, if you can do it on two dimensions, you can probably just you know, squeeze it and make it be a tree. Yeah, if, if you project the two dimensions, you can like, you project it to a ball of area V in two dimensions, and then you can fold up that ball. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. So, so in. Okay. Um, so, the main, so the main theorem, uh, which I'll try to give a vague uh, idea of, is that uh, for so for arbitrarily large V, there is some code with V qubits, V to the one third logic, some polylog factor logical qubits, and distance at least V to the two thirds, also some polylog factors. So these polylog factors are kind of annoying, and I don't think they're necessary, but the proof, I don't know how to get rid of them in the proof. Um, um, and so, and there's some theorem that was known before that says that this is optimal except for these polylog factors. So if you have a local code, its distance can't be bigger than like v to the two thirds. You can you can cut it with a hyperplane and you know, have to separate. It's something like that, yeah. Yeah. Um, Just to understand that you cannot do better with. So v to the one, for, there are two parameters, v to the right. one third and v to the two thirds. So uh, what do you mean if you shrink one right. and gain the other? Or? Yes, you can. So, but, um, so what I mean is that if the distance is like v to the two thirds, then the logical qubits are bounded by something like v to the one third. But if you decrease the distance, there is also some equation that tells you how the logical qubits can grow. Um, so, in particular, these uh, these code these cool codes of Pantelaid Kalachev, they're not local. So this is this is a little bit of um, a new construction. Um, and now we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk a little bit about geometry because it turns out it's much easier to understand this local condition from a geometric perspective. So just. Pause if there's any questions on. Okay. Uh, so a crash course in some geometry of triangulated manifolds. Um, so we're gonna let D be some dimension and M be a triangulated D-dimensional manifold. So that means we M is basically composed of d-dimensional simplices. And locally, it looks like a Euclidean ball. Um, and we're going to define these vector spaces C i of M, which are spanned by the i simplices. And these are usually called the names of F2 coefficients. And uh, as with the torus, there's these natural boundary maps um, that are given by the triangulation. Okay. Uh, and an interesting geometric invariant of a of this triangulated manifold is its k-systole. 
a k systole is the minimum Hamming wage of a of a vector that's inside the kernel of like the kth boundary map mod the image of the k plus one boundary map. Um, and intuitively, the k systole measures the size of the smallest k dimensional hole in M. So a uh, good example to keep in mind is like the standard d-dimensional torus of these simplices. So it's like the picture I drew here, except higher dimensions. And the, the case to still the torus is like b to the k over d. And the reason is that if I take a d-dimensional cube, which has volume v, I can uh, find, a, find an element in here, which is just the k homology group, by slicing that cube in a k-dimensional plane. So if that k-dimensional slice, of course, corresponds to a k-dimensional torus inside our d-dimensional torus. And its size is going to be like p to the k over d. Um, okay. And then here's kind of an, a non standard um, geometric feature of M, which is going to be relevant to us. Uh, so we'll say a map from M to R three is coarse if the image of if the image under F of each simplex has diameter O of one, and the preimage of each unit ball in R three intersects O of one simplices in M. So this roughly means we can kind of collapse M to three dimensional space without really changing the geometry too much. So it doesn't really have large preimages and it doesn't stretch simplices. So for example, if we take a very large four dimensional ball with a standard triangulation, then there is no course map from that ball to R3. Because no matter how we collapse a very large four dimensional ball to R3, it's going to have some pre image, which, which has size like volume to the three fourths. These manifolds, they, they're either simple and, three, and kind of three-dimensional or very complicated, but then kind of look like less than three-dimensional, maybe two or one-dimensional. That's, that's what this uh, existence of this course map captures. Okay. Yeah. And this is the kind of, this slide is, is kind of the main reason why we care about geometry for doing coding theory, uh, because there is a rough correspondence between codes and manifolds, properties of codes and properties of manifolds. Uh, so for a CSS code C, we, we associate a d-dimensional triangulated manifold. A qubit corresponds to a k simplex. k is going to be also some constant we choose that's less than d. A logical qubit is a basis element in k or d minus k dimensional homology. So it turns out that logical qubits are like holes that are k-dimensional or d minus k-dimensional in homology. Um, these, uh, these maps H1 and H2 in the definition of a code being sparse is kind of like the triangulation being sparse. So that means there is O of one simplices adjacent to each vertex. The distance of the cold is like the minimum between the k-systole and the d minus k-systole. So uh, it's kind of like the, the size of the two smallest holes in dual dimensions in the manifold. And the code being local is kind of like there being a coarse map from M to uh, a three-dimensional ball of volume V. This is radius V to the one third inside R3. So that it's not too hard to believe. This looks very similar to the definition of a, being a local code. And if I go back, this definition of a systole is kind of similar to the definition of a distance of a code. And because D, D is uh, also like O of one, so O of one can depend on D. Yeah, D, D is gonna be like some constant, yeah. The other direction also would be true. If you give you a code, you can find a manifold in a simple way. Yeah, so, so well, let me- a manifold code, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about this. So from a manifold to, given a manifold,
scaffold, it's not too hard to create a code. You just take a, a part of its chain complex. That's, that's been known for a long time. And it turns out initially interesting codes were found like this. You first find a cool manifold and then you get a cool code. Uh, but recently it turns out that wasn't good anymore. Uh, that result of Pantelev Kalachev, I mentioned it didn't rely on manifolds. It was some algebraic construction. Um, and so it became interesting for geometers to find a manifold from it. And it turns out that there is a result from Friedman, uh, Friedman and Hastings um, from a few years ago, which uh, creates a manifold from a code with this correspondence being true. And um, kind of a lot, a lot of messiness comes from this construction not being natural like this one. In particular, for them, D has to be greater than 10, and K is like um, between something larger than 3 and less than D minus 3. Um, but with those restrictions and some mild conditions on this code, they, they were able to achieve this correspondence. OK, uh, so now I'm going to, if, there, if there's no more questions about this part, I'm going to kind of sketch the proof of that main theorem. Okay, so just to remind you, we want to construct a, a local code so that the distance of the code is, is bounded from below roughly by the number of qubits to the two thirds. And so, so just from everything you said so far, it means that if you wanted those parameters with epsilon v dimension and distance, you couldn't make it local. Like the, the construction of Pantelev Kalachev? Yeah. Yes, that's right. Their construction is not local. No, but if, but there could not could not exist a construction with those parameters that is local. Which parameters? The constant uh, with epsilon v dimension and epsilon v. Right, yes, yes, you, you cannot, uh, those cannot be local. So v to the number of qubits to the two thirds is the upper bound of this local code. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to take as our starting point this construction of Pantelev Kalachov, uh, which is a code with v qubits and distance like linear in the number of qubits, so roughly like v. We could take anything to start, but this will give us the best, uh, the best bounds and best constants in the end. And we're going to apply the friedman hasting construction to get a triangulated manifold M with B simplices. And so that it's K systole and V minus K systole is roughly like V. Um, and it turns out so um, that we don't know any other way of finding these manifolds other than to go through these two steps. So it's a very, unintuitive geom manifold with some geometry. Um, and then the idea is to analyze this Friedman-Hastings construction a little bit. So it's not, it's not too hard, but um, um, we'll show, you show that their construction gives you a two-dimensional simplicial complex and a map G from um, the manifold M to X. So that the pre-image of each simplex intersects O of one simplices in M, and the image of each simplex intersects O of one simplices in X. So it's kind of like this map is coarse, except the image is some complicated two-dimensional space. Uh, so the reason we do this is, uh, as you can expect, we want to kind of find a map from M into R3. And if M really looks like a high-dimensional object, that doesn't work. So the only chance of it working is if we can first find a lower dimensional object, which approximates the manifold. <clears throat> okay, so M is close to like this two dimensional complex. Um, another thing, which is kind of uh, an annoying point is that we can't replace M with X because the chain complex of X doesn't correspond to a quantum code exactly. So we really need to keep track of the information in M in order to get back an interesting code. So this is kind of some intermediary object, which is not super clear to me how to understand. I have some vague ideas of what it looks like. Okay, and now the, the next step is uh, 
is a uh, user result of Grown Up and Goose, which I'll explain a little bit later. Um, to find a map i from x to a, a three dimensional ball in R3, um, whose radius is v times some polylog factor. Um, and the, prop the interesting property of this map is that the preimage of each unit ball intersects O of one simplices. However, this map stretches the simplices of X to, diam to have diameter V and area roughly V squared. Okay, so this is like half of what it means to be coarse, right? So this second, second line here is what keeps that map from being coarse. Because to be coarse, you need to map each simplex into a constant radius ball. Cool. Um, um, uh, maybe I should say another thing. So it's, it's kind of very intuitive how to find this map if you're working with geometrical objects, but this step is really not clear to me how to do without the geometry, just to do it with codes. It's not clear what the analogous map would be. So that's why uh, the geometry is helpful. Okay. Uh, and then the next step is we subdivide uh, this complex x to x tilde, m to m tilde, and we get this, uh, this, we still have this composition of maps, and this composition is now coarse. So why do we do this? Because if you stretch each simplex a lot, then if you subdivide that simplex, then now the new simplices are much smaller in the image. So after subdivision, each simplex in x tilde, it gets mapped into a ball of constant radius. That's this is kind of a very easy step to understand geometrically. Again, a much more difficult step to understand without knowing, without, um, without having the geometry. It's not clear what it needs to be. Subdivide a quantum code, like just a two term, three term chain complex. You're just making the synthesis much, much smaller. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not, I mean, it would be kind of annoying to define it really technically, but. The idea is that if you, instead of simplices, you have a cube, you just have divided like this. Like this. So if your initial cube was kind of stretched to size V squared, if you subdivided it into V squared, smaller cubes, each new cube is now size of one. That's the rough idea. Because it's in R3, the V squared is like two thirds or something. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so after the subdivision, M has roughly V cubed polylog V. So this comes from the fact that each simplex we divided V squared times because it's like I stretched it to size V squared. Uh, so there's a polylog factor, which we, should, we don't need to worry about too much. But uh, you initially had V simplices and you cut each one into V squared simplices. So V times V squared is V cubed. Okay, and the, uh, another interesting thing is that the, the K and D minus K system, they go up by v, to V squared. So it turns out, this is also a little, not too hard, but a little technical to explain that when you subdivide a D dimensional object, um, the K dimensional objects inside it, they don't grow at the same rate as the large object. If you subdivide a d-dimensional object s times, it grows by like s to the d factor, but a k-dimensional object inside it grows like s to the k. Right. So that's that's the rough reason why the systole doesn't grow to be cubed. If there's time, I, I, I can explain this in more detail. Um, okay. And then the final step is we, we do this easy procedure of then converting M tilde to a code. And the code has V cubed polylog V qubits because, because of this. And it has distance V squared polylog V because the distance corresponds to the minimum of these two. So that's, that's, the, that's the outline of this proof. And where, where does the dimension become like, okay, the distance becomes V to the one third? Uh, so, so now this, this has roughly V cubed qubits, and the distance is like the number of qubits to the two thirds. So this V squared is like V cubed to the two thirds. The dimension is uh, V. Right. So, okay, so that's another, 
I took it out uh, just to remove the number of details on the board, but when you subdivide a manifold, its homology doesn't change, right? So, the, so this manifold M had roughly K, K homology, the dimension of its K, the homology was V. Um, that's again comes from this pantaleev kolachev construction. But when we subdivide it, that still stays V. So this M tilde also has K dimensional homology of um, dimension V, right? So that's like this to the one third. Uh, so that's where V to the one third for the dimension comes from. But, um, but I think that this is kind of the more, the more interesting part, so I left it up. I'm going to talk about this result a little bit. If there's any questions before I do that? Kind of a lot. So the, the, this, the three steps, three is when X is already two dimensional. Yes. The, the, the bonds on the system is only works because you can find this map to X, right? Because it, it shouldn't work for an arbitrary for that action, right? It sounds like really it's suspicious. That's right. That's right. It's, a, it's, a, it's, particular. It's, it's particular. I can say a word about it, actually. So the systole of M is like V. So what that roughly means is that if you take it, let's go back. Right. I mean, the loops have, the non trivial loops have size of worth repeats, right? Right. So, but this, the case is still some high dimensional object, K dimensional object inside M. Mm -hmm. And it's because it has roughly the same size as M, this K dimensional object spreads out across all of M. So, when we map it to X, its image is called to also spread out across all of X, but it could be spread out just on the edges of X. It's just some connected object inside X. It might be one dimensional because there's a collapse of dimension. This is D dimensional, it could be like a hundred, and this is two dimensional. Mm -hmm. So the K dimensional system could collapse to one dimensional object under G. Okay. So all we know is that the image of this system is a like roughly V edges inside K, inside X. Okay, now when we subdivide x to x tilde, we subdivide each edge v times because we subdivided each simplex v squared times. So I mean, that roughly makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so now the number of subdivided edges inside the image of the systole is like v squared because initially the image of the systole in x had v edges. We subdivided each one and each edge v right, times. So you're very strongly using the map because yes. you're saying it, yeah, I subdivided here, but when I map, I noticed it was a subdivision here. So you can see yeah. That. That's, yeah. That's what gives you the con. Exactly. So you're kind of the subdivision here is the pullback of the subdivision on x in some ah, okay. sense. Yeah. Okay. So, so the, okay. So this is not a this is not a uniform subdivision on m tilde. That's right. kind of important too. And you subdivide x and then pull back this. Yeah. Way. What do you lose by applying G exactly? If, you, if everything kind of stays about this, up to a constant, it stays about the same or going to two dimension? I mean, what, what's lost there? The, um, the structure of the systems. So um, in M, you had K dimensional and D minus K dimensional systems that corresponded to the distance of some code. Um, so you, what was important is there is a relationship between the homology representatives of M and the code. But it's what it's not clear what the homology representatives are in X. It's just the but so how do you get it back if you lose that somehow? Well you, you keep M. So so wait, so you get X, you embed X in R3. Yeah. But what you're interested in is actually the composition from M tilde to the ball. So you keep M. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the composition gives you locality, but the, the trick is that you're subdividing X to guide you how to subdivide M. 
you really want to just subdivide M, but there's not, you're not doing any other form of subdivision. This embedding tells you how to put together diff different checks in the original one somehow together. Yes. To get bigger checks. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's right. So, but there's this stretching that's happening, right? So, X, the, the map I, it stretches each simplex of X to. Uh, to kind of have diameter V. So now the, the checks kind of get very far apart if you don't worry, if you don't subdivide. So that's the issue. So you put in a lot of control how far apart so it's not too bad. Yeah, but you can, you, so these are, these are pretty uniform. So for every simplex, the image of its images has this diameter roughly. It looks like a standard two dimensional simplex of unit silence. Yeah. And subdividing it is like adding checks, but it's not clear what those checks are for me exactly without, uh, without like thinking about the geometry of them. Right. Cool. Okay. So um, the, the checks are to just the boundary maps. Yeah, the checks are like boundary maps, basically. But uh, yeah, but physically they're like operations. You run the qubits. No, no, I'm mean, yeah. trying to think of the the like, uh -huh. as well as the checks. It's the boundary maps. You don't want boundaries to be way too too large. That's right. So so uh, so for so for each in this two dimensional case. Each two-dimensional triangle is a check, uh -huh. which involves the boundary edges. Because yeah, the, you map it on R3 and you don't want these things. That's right. To be very stretched. Yeah. Because a, a cubic kind of has to map to a point in the lattice. But when you stretch an edge, it's not clear what where that qubit, the corresponds to the edge, gets mapped to. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I think this result of Gromov and Groof is, um, is, kind of, is kind of pretty and interesting. So I wanted to share the main idea of it. Uh, and it's also kind of the main, kind of a lot of uh, physical restrictions on implementing this, this local code. In particular, this polylog factor is, comes from this theorem. And actually there is also randomness involved in this theorem. So the codes we can are the codes at the end of the day are not constructed. They involve some randomness because of the step. Um, okay. So here's a, just a slightly more general version of that result uh, where we're mapping into n dimensions instead of three dimensions. Um, so if X is an m dimensional simplicial complex, of size V, so it has roughly V simplices, with O of one simplices adjacent to each vertex, then for any N bigger than M, there is a map from X to a ball with this radius inside N dimensional Euclidean space, so that the pre-image of each unit ball intersects O of one simplices in X. So that's the result. We can somehow, we, no matter how complicated X is, as long as it's locally simple, we can, map it into a, any larger dimensional space so that not too many simplices in the image overlap, right? But of course, the, it's, this map has to stretch simplices. Uh, so initially, this was actually a result about graphs mapping into R3 by Kolmogorov and Barsden back in the 70s. It made like a big impact on the science, uh, computer science community. So in 2011, uh, Gromov and Goof, they found a way to slightly change Kolmogorov's argument to uh, map simplicial complexes instead of graphs. So that's, um, that's some history behind this result. And the rough idea is that we're going to find this map I by showing that it exists with some 
non-zero probability. Then the previous yeah. one you also had that it doesn't stretch too much, but that's just implied by, by the diameter. Can you say it again? The previous slide you also said that the simplices don't uh, stretch too much. So that's so that the pre-image uh, here you mean? Uh, however, it stretches simplices to diameter v and v square, but but that's just implies by the diameter of the ball. It's not some extra. Right. That's right. Yeah. This comes from the diameter of the ball. So the analogous thing would be true in the general case. It would stretch it to a diameter of the ball you're mapping it to. Maybe maybe I should also pause for a second too. I just don't think about this. Another another interesting thing is that this bound on the radius is pretty sharp. And it's sharp because there are complexes of X that are have expander-like properties. Um, and it turns out that this feature, the sharpness of this result, is related to the sharpness of the local, the distance of the codes, because the codes also have expander-like properties. From this construction of Mendeleev Kalachev. So that the sharpness of the distance being like qubits to the two thirds, I think it, it kind of comes down to the sharpness of this result where for X, for very complicated complexes, X, uh, which expand in some sense. I have a few minutes, so um, let's talk about the main idea here. Right, so we'll, we're going to find I using the probabilistic method. And we'll start by finding a map I, I prime, which is going to be like a slightly simpler version of I. Uh, I prime is going to map the vertices of X randomly into the boundary of this ball. And then um, we extend um, bilinearity to all the simplices of X. So that's the definition for a random map I prime. Uh, so let's let's do a, a computation. Let's fix a unit ball B naught in R n. Any unit ball uh, should be inside this ball. So any B naught inside this ball. That's what we care about. Uh, then for some two simplex, uh, it should be m simplex. I'm sorry, it's a typo. For some m simplex uh, delta naught in X. The probability that its image, its image intersects this ball is like a constant times v to the minus one. So why is that? So we have this ball, v n, of roughly radius v to the one over n minus m. And we have the image of, of a simplex delta. Um, and we have some ball, v naught. The probability that this ball intersects this simplex is roughly like the area of this simplex, the volume of this simplex divided by the volume of the whole ball. Right. So if we're randomizing where the simplex lands, we might as well fix the simplex, but randomize where the ball lands. It's the same. So if we fix the simplex and compute the probability that a random ball hits it, that's like the air, the volume of the simplex, which is v to the m over n minus m over the volume of the ball, which is like this. Okay. So this is like v to the minus one. Okay. Some constants are there too. So the expected number of simplices in X whose image intersects B naught is some constant. Cool. So we can apply a churn up bound. You have some random variables whose expectation is a constant. <clears throat> the probability that the number of simplices in X that intersect some fixed unit ball under the image of I naught is, uh, is bigger than log of V is like this, E to the minus constant times log V. Uh, 
So this is the Chernoff bound. Uh, and so this is like V to the some small exponentials. Right. So this C right here, it's like this expected value. And we're going to add a factor of log V. Then we do a union bound over all the balls. The number of balls is kind of like V to some small power, maybe bigger than one. But it doesn't matter because as long as this constant is very small, we have not with non-zero probability um, a map I not I, I prime um, for which um, only log v simplices intersect any unit ball. Okay. So we found so we found a similar result to this where this O of one is like log v. Just using a few lines of like standard probabilistic method. Right. Uh, and it turns out to improve this uh, improve this log v um, to O of one, we need to we need to do a little bit more probability theory, but it's not too much more complicated than something like this. It involves perturbing this map i prime on a scale of log v, um, and that's where this polylog v comes from. <laughs> anyway, um, that's that's all I had in mind uh, for the talk. Anyways, the next slide says thank you. <laughs> so so you, you could uh, maybe also ask for these codes to be locally testable. Right. Uh, can you do that? <laughs> Um, so locally testable is, I guess, usually um, something about if, if a code word is uh, far in Hamming distance from the, your subspace, yeah. many of the checks should fire. Like. Right. Yeah. So that's that's something about the expansion properties about yeah, the co-boundary expander. Right. Yeah. So it's like saying M is a boundary expander in dimension K, and also co-boundary expander in dimension K, something right. like that. Um, that's very, it's a difficult question, <laughs> very difficult yeah. question. <laughs> and I probably, you want to approach it from the code side. If you start like, with a code, you're starting with some arbitrary code that's, let's say their code was already locally testable and right. do these transformations. Yeah. They stay somehow. I, I think so. I, I'm not sure, but. This could give you another way to construct co-boundary expanders. I think so. Like, um. Yeah, so this Friedman Hastings construction, it's not so complicated. So it it it's kind of the nice thing about it is that you can you can check if some new property of a code transfers to a, a manifold. I feel I think that this this property should transfer. <laughs> Any questions? Well, let, let's take it. Yeah.